so this is uh, the last lecture of this course. So thank you for being with me up to now. Uh, let me make a quick recap of what we uh, said yesterday for getting these uh, C3 beta estimates. Okay, so here I have this regular grid decomposition of a cube of the cross section of a cylinder where I have small excess. Okay, so say this was, for instance, a cube L. And what I'm going to do on top of this cube L, there is a very large ball over here, but large with a, um, a radius which is comparable to the side length. So I look it up, this ball is actually centered on the point PL. The point PL is in the graph of my, so it's, it's, it's contained in my area minimizing graph. Then I choose a plane which is optimizing the excess. So this is this place by L. I look at the graph in a tilted cylinder. Okay, in the tilted cylinder, I take the approximation, so the Lipschitz approximation FL. Okay, and then from the Lipschitz approximation, I produce what I call the tilting interpolation by uh, um, smoothing the approximation at scale L of L, where L of L is actually the side length of the cube. And then after I've done that, so here I have a function. So this will be the graph of G of, of, of ZL. And then I read actually the graph of ZL again down here. So as the graph of a function GL in my original system of coordinates for, so with the domain of GL lying on the flat, uh, um, on the flat horizontal plane by zero. Okay, and we don't, we then, we then constructed our approximation with the partition of unity and, and gluing all these GLs, and then we claimed two key estimates. So one key estimate was that each of these pieces GL has a uniform C3 beta estimates. And then there were estimates for nearby cubes, okay? So that actually when we are computing the derivatives of the uh, glued uh, thing, these estimates are killing kind of the singularities which are coming from the bump functions which are used in the partition of unity, okay? So I'm not going to show you the second estimate. I don't think I will have time. So, but I will focus on getting a C3, a C3 estimate for this GL. Actually, along the way, you will see at least intuitively why you should be able also to get the, cor the correct estimates for the difference between the functions into two nearby cubes. So the proof of the C3 estimate will actually give you an idea of what is happening for nearby cubes. So I will point out at the, at the exact place where this is happening, okay? So from now on, therefore, the focus is going to be the following proposition. Okay, I can actually control the C2 beta norm of the, of the derivative of GL with a constant times the excess to the power one half. Okay, so the excess I started with. Okay, and one first observation is that, so one first remark is that actually, since we already know that the tilting between this plane and the horizontal plane is proportional to the excess to the power one half. Okay, it's not too difficult and I believe it was given by Luca, my teaching assistant, as an exercise, maybe the second day. So it's not too difficult to see that in fact, it's sufficient to give a C3 beta estimate for this ZL in the tilted system of coordinates. Okay, and then when you actually reread your function in the new system of coordinates, you will get an, an uniform estimate for that, for, for, for that parameterization as well, right? So of course, it's obvious that if I have a small Lipschitz con constant, uh, uh, a small angle between two planes, and I have a C3 graph in the new system of coordinates, I'm going to have a C3 graph, right? So the important point is whether you really get an estimate of this kind from the fact that the tilting has the same control. 
Okay, it's not too difficult somehow. It's essentially an exercise which uses the implicit function theorem on how you reparameterize the graph in the um, um, original coordinates. So therefore, from now on, the focus is get a uniform C3 beta estimate for this piece ZL. Okay? Okay, so, and, and this is going to be the basic strategy. So the basic strategy is going to be the following. So, I fix a cube L, and I start looking, so at, uh, I mean, at each, uh, so this is a cube L at a certain, say, uh, uh, fineness of the, of the um, uh, a grid, so let's say L of L is uh, uh, the size of the initial cube, which is sigma, or maybe two sigma, so this is two sigma. So this is going to be two to the minus k times two sigma, okay? And if I consider the grid, at one step before with fineness two to the k minus one, there is a cube which is containing my cube L, right? I mean, I, I don't see color chalks. If I had color chalks, I would kind of make this cube uh, red, for instance. Okay, so now I consider therefore the, what I will call the ancestry of L, so L is going to be some cube LK, which is contained in some cube LK minus one, which is contained in some cube LK minus two, and so on, until I get to some cube L and zero, okay? And each of, I mean, each of these cubes, they belong to the grid of fineness uh, corresponding to two to the minus the power, I mean, minus the number that you see over here. Okay, so LJ is, is, a, is a member of CJ, and CJ was the grid with fineness two to, the, two, two to the minus J times two sigma, okay? And if you remember, N0 is the first time, I mean, it's kind of the biggest grid that we have, right, in the construction from yesterday. Okay, good. Now, so one first remark, is that, so of course, uh, let me fix, so let me fix the notation that we call pi the reference cube for, I mean the reference plane for pi L, which is pi LK. I mean of course, pi LK is certainly different from pi LJ for every J less than K, however, since I have this decay of the excess, the relative tilt between pi LJ and pi LK is actually comparable, so pi LJ minus pi LK, okay? This tilt is actually comparable to L of LJ, the largest cube, to the power one minus delta. And then here there is uh, E, uh, um, to the one half in front. Wait, why do we know the planes are different? Well, I mean, not necessarily, but you know, the planes are the planes optimi optimizing the excess at that ball. I mean, it, you must be unusually lucky to have the same plane, right? So I, I don't know it a priori, but I would expect it's going to be different, right? So the plane is kind of the average of the derivative of u at that scale. Of course, uh, at a smaller scale, the average of the derivative of u is going to be something else, okay? So one way, one way to prove this estimate is either to compare uh, the plane of one guy with the plane of his father, knowing that the excess is small. Another way to understand this estimate is that since you are C1, one minus delta, right? So this is the tilt that you can expect between the scale LJ and the scale LK, right? Okay, so this is just to say that 
uh, pi LK, so pi, is a good plane even at larger scales. What it means, it's a good, it's a good plane. It means that since the tilt is this e to the 1 half L of Lj to the power 1 minus delta, OK? The estimate that we have on the excess relative to this plane pi is essentially the same estimate that you have that for the plane pi Lj. OK? So in particular, so the excess of, say, the graph of u in the cylinder, uh, 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 which is going to be of the same size as the cylinder that we used to construct the function z lj, but it's going to be actually tilted re with respect to this new uh, uh, plane, pi. So here I will have some constant, and then square root of m, m0, and then I will have l, lj. And here, that will be the point p, lj, and the plane pi. So this excess is going to have exactly the same estimate that we had uh, um, for the uh, excess relative to the plane pi, lj. So E L of L J to the power 2, uh, so M plus 2 uh, minus 2 delta. Okay? So now what is the idea? The idea is that I will carry on my smoothing, I mean my approximation and smoothing procedure on my cube on which, I mean on the cylinder of the cube where I'm interested, on the cylinder of the father, on the cylinder of the grandfather, and so on. Right, so I have this family of nested cubes, uh, uh, sorry, of nested cylinders, and they are all with respect to the same system of coordinates. So here is my initial cylinder, so this is the reference pi, right? So this is the, the, the cylinder relative to the cube LK. Okay, so this will be contained in some other cylinder. Okay, so this is the cylinder relative to the cube LK minus one, and then eventually in another cylinder, and so on. LK minus two, and so on. Okay, and then in each cylinder, I carry on my procedure. So in each cylinder, I take uh, uh, a function f, which I will call fj. This is the Lipschitz approximation. So in each cylinder, I define fj. So this will be like the cylinder cj. So let us call this cylinder here ck minus 2, this cylinder here ck minus 1. So in each cj, I uh, uh, apply the approximation theorem. And define the function fj. And then I smooth this function at the scale of the cylinder. And then I define zj equal to fj smoothed with phi L of Lj. Okay, and now the game that I want to do is I want to compare the difference in C2, C3 norm, and so on between two nearby functions. Okay, so the idea now is that I want to estimate So the goal is to estimate f 
FJ, uh, sorry, ZJ, so a certain derivative DK of ZJ, maybe K is not a good uh, uh, name, DL of ZJ minus ZJ minus one in C0. And what I claim is actually that this here has the following estimate, is estimated by a constant E, and then there is L of Lj minus one, so the largest of the two cubes, and this is going to be to the power three plus beta minus L, okay? And now you see that as long as L is between zero and three, right, if I want to sum all these estimates, uh, uh, of course, I mean, this is a C0 estimate on the domain of the smallest function, right? Because the domains of the functions become smaller and smaller. So this is a, 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 an estimate on the domain on the smaller function. But after all, for us, what really matters is the final function. So the important point is that I'm able actually to estimate the difference on uh, the domain of the final function. And the cylinders are nested one inside each other, so the domain of one function, I mean, the domain of the, fa of the function of the father actually contains the domain of the function of the son, right? So now the idea is that uh, you see that this is a convergent series as long as L is between zero and three. Because this L of Lj to minus one is, so this is essentially two, to the minus j minus one times three plus beta minus l, right? So it's decaying geometrically. So now what I do is I simply look at the very first cylinder, the largest one. This is a cylinder at scale two to the n minus n zero, okay? And zero is a fixed scale. And I'm taking the convolution of a Lipschitz function at a fixed scale. So that function is actually C infinity. Right, and it's infinity with an estimate. What is the estimate actually depending upon? Well, for instance, I know that the Lipschitz constant has a certain bound, I can use the Lipschitz constant to make the bound. But actually, I have the excess, and the excess is like the L2 norm of the derivative of U. So I can use that one as a starting estimate, right? And then, okay, I have a starting function Z and zero, which is smooth, with a certain estimate, and then I'm summing a convergent series. So while I sum my convergent series, the derivatives will not explode. And the derivatives which are not exploding are the first derivative, I mean the zero, of course the, the zero order, the C0 norm of the function, the first derivative, second derivative, and the third derivative, okay? And you see that when I get at the fourth derivative, the fourth derivative is actually blowing up in a geometric fashion, right? So the C3 estimate is going to be obvious, and the C3 beta estimate is going to be an interpolation between the C4 estimate and the C3 estimate. That's the idea. Okay, so now, I told you that you see why uh, uh, nearby cubes have kind of the correct estimate, okay? So if you look at this estimate over here, this is actually, it's true with E, but for us, it's good even with e to the one half, okay? So this is the exact same structure of the estimates between two nearby cubes, okay? So I'm proving the estimate that I would have to prove between two nearby cubes, I'm proving it for father and son. It's a kind of similar situation. So the only thing that, I mean, there is one technical issue that you have to deal with, that is, in, in, in these estimates, I'm always having the same coordinate, right? I'm fixed the system of coordinates as given by the plane, which is the plane optimal for the smallest cube, right? In the situation in which I have two nearby cubes, I actually have two different systems of coordinates and I have to tilt this estimate. So I, I will have to make a change of coordinates to, 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 to make the estimate. So, the actual estimate that we will prove, it actually has an E over here, but when you're using the tilt of the system of coordinates, since the estimate is with E to the power one half, okay, is this E to the power one half, this will actually deteriorate this estimate with this E to the power one half over here. But the important point is that this will stay exactly the same. Okay, so now, how am I going to prove this estimate? Uh, so that will be a key proposition, and this is really where the most interesting analysis aspect of this problem actually happens. So the key proposition is the following. Um, uh, where did I put it? Oh, over there. 
And this is what we will focus in the next half an hour. So the key proposition is the following. Okay, so let us say f bar is your fj and z bar is your zj. Okay, then I'm claiming the following two estimates. So if delta bigger than zero and e are sufficiently small, and this sufficiently small is just some geometric constant, okay, then I have these two key estimates. So I have that z bar minus f bar in L1 is less or equal than a constant, and here, and here I have E um, L of L to the power M plus 3 plus beta. Okay, so if delta and D are sufficiently small, then there exists constant beta and C positive such that. So this is one estimate. And the other estimate is that the Laplacian of the J derivative of Z bar in C0 is less or equal than a constant, which depends on, uh, okay, J is bad, actually, let's say L. A constant which depends on L only, and here we have E, and then we have L of L to the power one minus j plus two beta, okay? Now, look, uh, look at two consecutive, um, so now I, I will show you from this proposition, I will sketch you the, uh, this estimate over here. Uh, M is the dimension, yes, yeah, right, yes. Sorry? Is L of L one minus L plus two beta? Uh, yeah, 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 yes. Right, absolutely. So each time I take a derivative, it deteriorates by something, okay? So now, I, I mean, just to give you an intuition for these estimates, right? So. Like, so, so like take L equals zero, right? If you take L equals zero, the Laplacian is like the second derivative. And I'm telling you the C0 estimate for the second derivative is L of L to the power one plus beta. I have written two beta, but beta is okay. Okay, this is an L1 estimate, so it has an L of L to the power M because of the dimension, and then it has three plus beta. So why three plus beta instead of one plus beta? Because the second derivative estimate scales two L of L's, I mean a power two of L of L worse than the C0 estimate, if you want, right? So there are all kinds of scaling invariants. I mean, if you were to scale everything back to the uh, cylinder of radius one, you would just find scaling invariant estimates. So this is the natural scaling that you're expecting. Okay, so now what I'm claiming is that well, first of all, by a very simple uh, 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 addition, so if I take the Laplacian of the derivative of the L derivative of Zj minus Z, Zj minus one, okay? Of course I can add, so this is Lj. Of course I can add these two estimates, and since the sides of Lj and the sides of Lj minus one, they are comparable by a factor two, I can actually write this. Right? For the Laplacian. Now I want to estimate the L1 norm of Zj minus Zj minus one. Okay, so what I will do is, I will, I will use the triangle inequality. So I estimate Zj minus Fj in L1. Then I estimate Fj minus Fj minus one in L1. And then I estimate fj minus one minus zj minus one in L1 again. 
Okay? So for these two pieces, I have, uh, uh, sorry, here there is no M. Uh, here I'm, I'm just, okay, so this is one minus L plus beta. So this is coming from this estimate here, sorry. Okay, so the L1 gets the M plus three plus beta. Okay, so here I will have Lj minus one, then a constant E, and then I have M plus three plus beta. Okay, so this is this piece and that piece for which I'm using the proposition. And then I'm left with Fj minus Fj minus one. So now, uh, what are Fj and Fj minus one? So they are two Lipschitz approximations, but of the same underlying graph. So here is Fj, here it's Fj minus one. Fj minus one. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this estimate on the domain of Fj. Okay? And Fj minus one and Fj, they are actually the Lipschitz approximation of the same graph. So they agree, except for a set of small measure. So how small is the measure we don't agree? So the measure where they don't agree, so fj minus one different from fj, intersected the domain of fj. Okay, so if you remember, this has the following estimate. So it has a constant e, it has l of lj minus one to the power m, okay? And then you remember that in the Lipschitz approximation, we had the excess on the cylinder, I mean the normalized excess on the cylinder, to the power one plus gamma. So here I have L of Lj minus one to the two minus two delta, and then I have to the power one plus gamma, okay? And if you remember what we remarked actually yesterday is that I will choose, so gamma is a fixed constant, and delta is for me to choose. So for delta sufficiently small, this is actually going to be two plus beta. So two minus two delta times one plus gamma is going to be equal to three is two plus beta, okay? But now both fj minus one and fj are two Lipschitz functions with Lipschitz constant less or equal than one actually. Well, it's, it's even less or equal than something small, right? The power of, of, of the size of the cube. They agree on this set on the complement of this set, which is certainly non-empty. So there is one point where they coincide. And since they are Lipschitz, the difference between them, I mean the C0 norm, the C0 uh, norm of them is estimated by the sides of the cube, okay? So Zj minus Zj minus one, I know by a trivial estimate in C0 is estimated by L of Lj minus one times a constant, okay? So now the integral, the L1 norm, is going to have the size where they are different, which has an estimate m plus two plus beta, and then times the C0 norm, which is giving you one extra power of L. Okay, so this guy has the same estimate, as this estimate over here. Okay, so now it's a simple, uh, it's a simple PDE exercise. Well, maybe not so simple somehow, but it's a classical PDE exercise. You have an estimate on the Laplacian. You have an estimate on the L1 norm, right? Now you can interpolate between them and get C0 estimate. For instance, if I use L equals zero. C1 estimate if I use L equal one. C2 estimate and so on. And it's not difficult to see that I mean, if you want, you can make the estimate at scale one somehow by rescaling everything. And this is the natural scaling for all these objects. So you will get similar scaling for the C0, C1, C2, C3 estimates, okay? So from interpolation, now you get Zj minus Zj minus one 
right? The L derivative of this is going to be less or equal than a constant, and then here you have E, and here you will have L uh, uh, J minus one to the power three plus beta minus L. And actually, you can see that the estimates work for any derivative. But after the derivative four, they are not interesting anymore somehow. So for the derivative four, we have a mild blow up. For the derivative, I mean, for the third derivative, you have a mild convergence. Then you interpolate, and you get the C3 beta estimates, right? So five, five derivatives you can keep track of, but they do not seem to have any useful purpose. Okay, very good. So this is the key proposition that we want to prove there. So in this proposition, there is really the meat of, of the C3 uh, estimate of, of Angren. So this proposition is really the important one. And okay, so let me prove this proposition, therefore. So I'm not 100% sure I'm able to show you the L1 estimate. I will maybe just give you an idea of the L1 estimate. But the C0 estimate, I can actually show in full details. Okay, so now we don't have to care about uh, fathers, grandfathers, ancestors, and whatever. So that is actually a proposition which is given at a certain fixed scale, okay? And not only it's, a, it's an estimate which is given at a, first, at, at a certain fixed scale, right? I'm also am with a certain fixed system of coordinates. So now I'm actually going to draw the cylinder kind of uh, um, vertical, right? Okay, so in this case, I have my function f bar. f bar is a Lipschitz approximation of the area minimizing, I mean, of the function which describes the area minimizing graph in this system, in this tilted system of coordinates. So the original function was u for the function which is describing the graph in this system of coordinates, which I then rotated, let us use v, okay? Okay, so then I know that v is area minimizing Okay, and what I know is that the excess in this cylinder where I'm interested of the graph of V, so the cylinder is C, and this is with respect to the plane pi, so now the plane pi is the horizontal plane, so this excess as the estimate constant E and then L to the power, uh, so L of L to the power M plus two minus two delta. Okay, so, V is a area minimizing graph, therefore V is actually stationary for the usual 